salvation sound. Tearing through the veil of darkness, breaking every chain you set us free. Fighting for the furthest heart you gave your love is relentless. 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 You carry us. You carry us. Your love is relentless. You cover us. You cover us. Love is relentless. You carry us. You carry us. Love is relentless. You cover us. You cover us. Your love is relentless. Please have a seat. Good morning, church. Good Good morning. morning. Um, This morning, I want to remind you all and repeat the invitation that Pastor uh, Mike has mentioned the last few weeks, and me as well, that there is um, Free Methodist USA is hosting an online prayer summit, which begins at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time every Sunday through September 27th. You can join online at facebook.com forward slash FMCUSA. Um, each week they're focusing on a specific point of prayer, and we're hopey, hopeful that you can join. And now we go to the Lord in prayer. Rescuer, name above all names, Jesus. Thank you for reigning in power and supplying us with weapons of victory. Forgive us when we allow the things of this world to take our eyes off of you and when we shift blame where it doesn't belong. Please focus our spiritual eyes so that we can clearly see the enemy manipulating our life while hiding in the shadows. Keep us alert and keenly aware of his foolish strategies to come against us, our families, our church, our community, and our country to steal, to kill, and destroy. Remind us that our struggle is not against flesh and blood or what or who we see, but against the rulers, powers, and worldly forces of darkness and against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places, what or who we can't see. Help us to daily put on the full armor of God, truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, the good news, and your holy word so that we can stand against the schemes of the devil. You, Lord, are faithful and will strengthen and protect us from the evil one. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're able, please stand. There's a house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I
Well, it's good to be back. Uh, it was also nice to be gone. I hadn't taken a day off in quite some time, so it was refreshing. We actually attended a church service at a church in San Mateo while we were down in that area, and it was, uh, it was refreshing. It really was. It was refreshing. Now, I did manage to watch the service from last week, and uh, most folks liked it. Todd filled in. Again, I thank him again for filling the last, last minute notice there. Uh, something kind of funny happened. Before I left, I was entering the verses in the computer, and he was in Luke chapter 5. Well, as I was in there putting verses in and looking around stuff, I started reading Luke chapter 6. So today's sermon will include passages from Luke chapter 6. I couldn't help it. I just started reading it, you know, and just one thing leads to another. So what we've done now is we've gone through a, uh, about uh, seven sermons on Old Testament characters. And so we end that, we leave it behind now, and technically he already started in Luke last week, so we'll read a bit more Luke this week. And you know what, next week, we might do a little bit more Luke. Who knows? We'll see what happens. Luke chapter 6, verse 1. Luke chapter 6, verse 1. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the green fields, and his his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. Verse 2. Some of the Pharisees asked, Why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? So, I mean, it sounds like it was a Sabbath, which is technically what we would call Saturday. And even then, it's a little bit odd. Jewish days were considered from sundown to sundown. From sundown to sundown was a day. Not from morning to morning, but from sundown to sundown. A little different way of counting. Still works, but a little different way of counting. So by our standards, the Holy Sabbath would have been from Friday evening till Saturday uh, near dark, at, 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 uh, at dark, at sundown. So it's the holy day, so somewhere between Friday and Saturday there. Jesus and his, and his disciples were going through a grain field, and some of them started grabbing little heads and snacking them as they walked past. Maybe they were starving to death. Maybe it was just kind of an impulse. And as often, if you know, around here we don't see too many uh, fruit trees and what have you. But uh, California, where I grew up, everybody had fruit trees. I mean, all around, we had a little backyard. In our little backyard in San Jose, was a pomegranate tree hanging over from a neighbor's house, a lemon tree. We had two nectarine trees. I think there was an orange in there somewhere. There was honeysuckle. On, you know, All these things you could snack on as you walked around the fence line. And our backyard wasn't as big as, probably as big as this room. You know, all that growing around there. So whether it was they were starving to death or it was simply a matter of impulse, I don't know. But the Pharisees in verse 2 saw them snacking. Saw them snacking and they asked, Why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Well, when it comes to the Sabbath, the holy day dedicated to the Lord, this Friday evening, Saturday uh, event, you were supposed to refrain from all sorts of activities in the Jewish law. I mean, just about everything. Uh, I don't have this on us, so don't worry about it, Adam. Uh, Just reading from Exodus 35. Moses assembled the whole Israelite community and said to them, These are the things the Lord has commanded you to do. For six days work is to be done, but on the seventh day shall be uh, your holy day, a day of Sabbath rest to the Lord. And then the rest of the verse. Whoever does any work on these days is to be put to death. It even says in verse 3, Do not light a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. You were supposed to refrain from, sounds like, just about everything. A very holy day. Now, when it comes to a religious practice, and I talk about this a lot, I realize I do, some people have a habit of watering them down to their insignificant. You know? The same token, sometimes people have a way of exalting them so high they're more than they were ever intended to be. And this could work on any particular Christian activity. You know, I've known people who said, you know, communion has to be done with real wine, uh, fermented, and unleavened bread. And if you could get the wine from the grapes in Israel, that would even be better. You know, I mean, if you really want to one-up your communion. You know, uh, I've seen similar things said with other religious practices. And on this issue of what should a Christian do on the Holy Sabbath day, Um, There's all sorts of things to explain 
and things to talk about. So I'm going to do that. The reason I tell you ahead of time is I really want to talk about what Jesus said. But in order to understand this, I need to talk about this Sabbath, or the actual word's more like Shabbat. It was Anglicized, is that the right word, when they translated it into more of a King James English, from Shabbat to Sabbath. In fact, the Spanish word for Saturday sounds a great deal like that. Sabado sounds, sounds much more like uh, Saturday. And again, the, one of the first questions is, well, if Saturday's the big day, why are we meeting on Sunday? It's a fair question to ask. And in fact, around town, I don't know if any church, I think there's a prayer meeting on one Saturday at one church and maybe the mass, there's a Saturday mass. But I mean, clearly, Christians in this town don't go to church too much on Saturdays. Why is that? Well, you find early on as you read through the Bible, the Christians started meeting on Sunday. They called it the Lord's Day. It was the day he was resurrected. It becomes a special day, the Lord's Day. In fact, if you really want to be kicking it old school, and doing exactly what the Bible says, chances are they were still practicing Jews. They went to synagogue on Saturdays, but then they got together to talk about the Messiah on Sundays. They were probably doing church and religious festivities two times, two days a week. Their whole weekend was full of Christian activities. But Sunday has become the holy day. And this passage we're talking about, once I eventually get back to the passage, uh, kind of explains some of the reasons Christians don't elevate Sabbath that high, generally speaking, the actual Sabbath to refrain from all activities and to hold uh, the Saturday holy. All sorts of comments. This is one of those things where I bet you if you ask 10, 12 Christians, on, you know, how, do you, how do you properly address the issue of the Sabbath? You might get 10, 12 different answers. You might be no better to getting a good answer by the time you're done asking everybody than before you started. For instance, uh, here's one I found online. In every dispensation, the Lord has commanded us holy people to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. Every dispensation. And that kind of talks about before the flood, you know, it was one kind of particular time, after the flood, uh, after Moses, maybe a dispensation, the arrival of Jesus, another dispensation, another period of time, you know, uh, type of thing. And this says, Moses said, all the Israelites in every dispensation and tells them, uh, uh, every, the Lord has commanded to remember the Sabbath. Many promises and blessings are extended to those who keep the law of the Sabbath. For example, in the days of Jeremiah, the Lord promised to spare Jerusalem and its inhabitants if they would keep the Sabbath. And it quotes Jeremiah 17, 20 through 27. In our day, the Lord has promised us the fullness of the earth if we will obey his commandments. Now, for those of you who are consider yourself a Bible scholar, that last part I just read should strike a cue, a little a pause. Where does the Lord say we have to keep the Sabbath and he promised us the fullness of the earth? Where does it say that? Well, it doesn't. I'm actually reading from Doctrines and Covenants, which is a book the Mormons prescribe to, one of the extra books they use besides the Bible. So you can see there that in the Mormon tradition, keeping the Sabbath very important. I found this website that really, I mean, this thing goes on for a while, tries to explain the best proper way of keeping the Sabbath. It explains that there are 39 prohibited activities specifically addressed in the Bible in some way or another. Some of these are also based on the, Mish, the Mishrash and the, and the Talmud. These are extra Old Testament writings besides the Old Testament, extra Jewish writings. And so they're basing this on not just what the Bible says, the Old Testament says, but also what these other commentaries say. And we have other commentaries on Christianity. We have letters of old saints and fathers of the church. And I have a set of Matthew Henry commentaries at home. So you can always look up what Matthew Henry said. You don't have to have the commentaries at home now. You can do it online. But you know, we have all these extra resources. And I mean, I'm not against looking at some of them. But here's what they came up with. Based on all these things, there are 39 activities which are to be prohibited. Sowing, plowing, reaping, binding sheaves. For those of you who wanted to go home today and bind your sheaves, I don't know. Threshing, winnowing, selecting, grinding, sifting, kneading, baking, shearing wood, beating wood, dyeing wood, split, uh, spining, weaving, making two loops. I guess one loop's okay, but not two, whatever that loop is. I assume it's some sort of weaving based on these other things. Weaving two threads, separating two threads, tying, untying, sewing stitches, tearing, 
trapping and slaughtering, but wait, there's more, flaying, tanning, scalp, uh, scraping hide, marking hides, cutting hides into shape, writing two or more letters, erasing two or more letters, building, demolishing, extinguishing a fire, kindling a fire, putting the finished touches on an object, transporting an object between a private and a public domain, or in your own private home of a distance of more than four cubits. So you weren't supposed to pick up and carry a thing very far in your own home, otherwise you were working on the Sabbath. Now, I'm not promoting this particular web page, but I would make the point that these web pages are out there to encourage people in some crazy form or another to honor the Sabbath day. It goes on further to explain that the first 11 categories are all activities required to bake bread. The next 13 categories are all activities required to make garments. The next nine in the categories are all activities to make leather. And finally, the final six ingredients are required to build a structure or a building. Now you can see they're interpreting it that way. So these are the things they suggest you do on a Shabbat or a Sabbath day. Spending Shabbat together with one's own immediate family. I'm not even going to argue against that. I think it's always a great idea. Uh, temple attendance for prayers. Another good idea. Uh, visiting family and friends, but then it puts in quotations, within walking distance. I guess it depends on how good of a walker you are, you know. In fact, in this weather, I wouldn't walk too far if I were you. Uh, California smoke. Uh, hosting guests is okay, according to this list. Singing hymns and things for the Sabbath is Okay. Reading, studying, and discussing the Torah, the law, Moses' words, and commentary, or the Mishnah, or the Talmud, these other uh, Jewish writings. And it goes on to say, according to tradition, one should avoid one's normal occupation or profession on Shabbat whenever, thing, whenever possible and engage only in those types of activities that enhance joy, rest, and holiness of the day. Now there you can see they've taken the rules and they start to twist them a little bit, a little, little bit. And so what it comes down to is, it's not saying you can't do everything. It's just saying you can't do a lot of things. And you could do this if you don't do that. You could do this if you don't do that. You could do this if you don't. That's this mindset people have on how to do it right. All the details and how far can you walk on a Sabbath day. You know, when does it become working? There was rules for that. I even heard one talked about in a sermon. I didn't research it. Where you could, ex you could expend it. If you had a possession you needed to require, your own possession, you could go a little further. And someone suggested that what you do then on Friday is you leave a few things around town where you needed to go on, on Saturday. And when it came time to make your trip, you had to go get your possessions in these particular locations. I'm not saying I did not research that when I've heard it said in sermons before. But you can see when you're making your rules, you want to make them high, but you can't make them impossible. And, you want to, and if you do all of them, then you look pretty cool. I always talk about people elevating any type of religious practice. And these are just some of the websites that talk about it. Now, uh, churches today that practice the Saturday, and I'll tell you a funny one right now is, you know what, I don't care what day you go to church on, personally. I don't. I'm just happy to hear you're going to church. There's a lot of folks that can't make it no matter what day of the week it is. So you're going on Saturday, you're going on Sunday, you're going on Monday, whatever. I'm happy to hear it. More power to you. Glad you're going. I actually spoke at the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Reno one time. Now, when I say it like that, it's kind of cool. Here I am crossing denominational lines. I'm speaking at a Seventh-day Adventist church. Uh, but that's not the reality. The reality is there was a small little free Methodist church meeting there on Sunday because Seventh-day Adventists meet on Saturday. They don't use their buildings on Sunday. So sometimes you can rent yourself a little church hall uh, on Sunday from a Seventh-day Adventist church. That's what actually happened there. I was on Arlington back in the day. I think it's moved now for those who know Reno well. So uh, that's a type of church that doesn't do it. There's other type of churches that try to bring in this type of thing and religious groups and Christian groups and kosher eating and follow all the dietary requirements. But you have some glimpses in the New Testament uh, that kind of would push your thinking the other way when it comes to food, when it comes to dress, when it comes to these things. Now what this webpage did, and I'm not saying it was a completely Christian webpage, though it did call itself Nazarene something, um, is you read through the New Testament, you might have some contrary ideas. What this page did, 
It's the only quote of the verse that's liked. Whenever the word Sabbath was used in the sense of an actual Sabbath. Now, it didn't, it didn't quote the Apostle Paul. And he says, let no man judge you in holiday and special holy day and Sabbath. And Apostle Paul says that. It doesn't quote that verse in his webpage. It just quotes the ones it likes. It helps prove its point. <clears throat> so here's the issue. This is a holy, holy day. You're supposed to keep it simple and remember the Lord. You know, that's the point. And here they are walking through the field. Maybe they're walking too far, I don't know. And they were technically, quote, unquote, working because they were pressing, crushing out a little bit of grain to eat from the heads of the wheat or corn or whatever it was. Verse 3, Luke 6, verse 3. Jesus answered them, Have you never read what David did and he, when he and his companions were hungry? Verse 4. He entered the house of God, and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for priests to eat, and then he gave some to his companions. And we can stop there. So, He's, they're putting them on the spot. You know, you guys are working. Now, were they really worried about the Sabbath? Or as we read on, do they just hate Jesus and were looking for anything to accuse them of? They just couldn't stand Jesus. He was changing tradition. Tradition is a powerful force. Now, I don't care anything you suggest is something new. Somebody will have a problem with it. Why? Because it's new. My guess is when the first person wanted to put a pipe organ in a church, everybody said, we don't need that gaudy thing in here and that contraption of man and, you know, worship to the Lord. And, of course, it became incredibly popular. My guess is sometime later when someone suggested not using one, someone was up in arms. Well, we've always had a pipe organ. We've always done this, you know. That is the human condition. And tradition is a powerful force. I was at a church service two weeks ago where a man was wearing a baseball cap. And a woman walked up to him and said, you need to remove your hat. Why? She came to a tradition when you, women wore hats in church, but men didn't. That was her, the tradition she was fond of. It was a very popular tradition. And she felt this man should remove his hat. He explained his head is bald, it gets cold, he's not taking his hat off no matter what she says. <laughs> and you know what? She just stood there staring at him for quite a while. It's like, oh, this is going to get real, you know. But... No fists were thrown and everyone settled back down and uh, uh, you know, things went on. That was two weeks ago, two weeks ago. So you have all this powerful tradition taking place. And on top of that, just not liking the guy, you're looking for any reason to accuse him. So Jesus brings up this Old Testament story. Uh, for those at home, this Old Testament story, the words appear over here sometimes. Uh, and up there for you here. Jesus answered them, in verse 3 again, Have you never read when David and his friends, his friends were hungry, verse 4, he entered the house of God, and taking the consecrated bread he ate, which is only lawful for the priest to eat, and he also gave some to his companions. So he reminds them of the Old Testament, their own history. And says, so, don't you remember? David and his companions were hungry. They went into the temple, the tabernacle, and they ate bread which was consecrated only for use in the holy service of God, and only the priests were to eat it. He ate, King David ate it, and gave some to his companions. I mean, that, uh, God didn't send a lightning bolt right then. They didn't kill him for that, you know. And then there's some interesting parallels. During that time of David's life, the leaders of Israel, King Saul, hated him for what he was. He was doing good. He was killing tens of thousands in his military campaigns. And Saul was only killing thousands. They were singing a song like that, it says. King Saul was jealous of him and hated him and wanted to see him done away with. He was on the run. And isn't it interesting, the Jews felt similar about Jesus. An interesting parallel. They hated him and for him doing good and for what he was doing, and they wanted to kill him. And then in verse 5, uh, verse 5, Jesus says, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. When you have confusions about how to keep your holy day or make a holy day or whatever, um, remember this. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. He's in charge. He knows what's best. And think about the, we could try to make all these lists and rules of what we're supposed to do, right? I hope that if my house catches on fire during the Sabbath, there's some firefighters willing to work on the Sabbath. 
fact, I feel the same way about emergency surgery in the, in, the, in the medical room. I feel the same way about all sorts of things, police and everything else. And think what you could do on the excess of these rules. You could say, hey, it's the holy day. I'm not leaving the house. I'm not walking more than so many paces. I'm just going to reflect on the Lord. Your neighbor could be outside, you know, struggling in the heat to move some lumber, you know, and you're, you are free from helping them whatsoever because you're living by your rules. Um, really, you could apply one rule and, and in, in so doing, break all sorts of other ones about loving your neighbor and going the extra mile. Right? Uh, what does a minister do on a holy day? Or a rabbi, for that matter? How do they work and not work on a day where they're not supposed to work? So there's always been an exception to the rule on that one. So I encourage people not to get too caught up on this, though there are many who do, and there's just websites beyond belief to help you encourage you in your endeavors should you want to really elevate the Sabbath and then think you're getting somewhere. We've mentioned this many times before. I'll mention it again. God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. So in the Bible, we, in the New Testament, we find that uh, circumcision doesn't matter, which was very important to the Jewish faith um, because it's not about that. It's about your heart. In fact, it's not about Sunday or Saturday. It's about every day and how you're living your life. And that's what God's looking at. It's not just because you had a you did nothing on Saturday besides sing hymns and uh, you know eat cold food from the day before. You know, uh, you know. Technically, my refrigerator is working on Saturday. Should I unplug it? I mean, there's crazy questions you could ask. You know, um, and some people really got caught up on these things. I encourage you not to. In fact, there's so many other things that you'll probably get caught up on. You don't have to worry about this one. I encourage you not to get caught up on any of them, but humans are humans. And Jesus says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now this goes on, the same problem. Verse 6. On another Sabbath, he went into a synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. Verse 7. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So there's, they had some other motives as to why they, did, they, why they were such Sabbath keepers. And it wasn't for their own personal holiness. It was trying to find something to accuse Jesus of. It says they were, they were you know, wanted to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely, verse 7, to see if he would heal on the Sabbath, looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. Verse 8. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and he stood there. So, I mean... The line in the sand has been drawn. He knows they're watching him, hoping he will heal someone on Saturday. They go, aha, he's working, he's evil, he's not following the Lord's commands. Right? And of course, what was he going to do possibly? Heal somebody through the power of God. Even though it was a Saturday, what better day for the Lord to use his work than on his own holy day? Verse 9. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life or destroy it? And it's a fine question to ask, you know? And I think that's a fine question to ask. Should you be, what, is, what is more right to do? To do good or to stay home still? You know, to, you know to, to, to feed a poor person, even if it means you have to turn on the microwave, which technically, if you want to be little, you're not cooking with wood or fire. Huh? Huh? You can get around that rule. Right? Uh, good response there, Mike. Uh, he looked around at all of them and said, verse 10, he looked around at all of them and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. And, of course, what could they say after that? Nothing, because he just left them with the question, should you do good or do bad or do evil? Should you save life or destroy it? Well, the obvious answer is God would want you to save life, not destroy it. He'd want you to do good, not to do evil. And that's what he did. And my guess is they just sat there with their mouths open with nothing left to say. A similar case comes up in Luke 14, again on the Sabbath. And Jesus explains to them a similar principle I've already talked about is, your ox or donkey has fallen into a pit on a Sabbath. Do you leave them there? Do you get them out? And of course, you get them out. You get some ropes and some help and whatever it takes to get that critter out of the well or the ditch or whatever they fell into. You don't leave them there until Sunday. And I certainly would encourage you, you know, 
even if it's working, you hear a crash outside, walk outside and pick up your cell phone and work the buttons to call 911. You know, do not go overboard on this. I have to say this a lot because people go overboard on just about everything. And again, either they go way over or they just completely reject it. That would be the other part of this. What's wrong with having a day dedicated to the Lord? Be it Saturday or Sunday. What's wrong with doing less on that day? What's wrong with working on fellowship and singing and Bible reading and discussions? My, some of my, I've had wonderful Bible discussions across a meal. And I don't care if it was fried chicken, manicotti, or tacos. Though tacos are my favorite. Right? I've had wonderful talks and biblical talks. And Sundays, it just seemed to last. Church lasted half the day. The church we were at last week, uh, that church lasts a long time. They get there, they fellowship, they sing, they have a sermon, they settle back down. It's kind of a, you'd think it was Thanksgiving at this house that we were at, the way they were just eating and chatting and carrying on, right? And that was church. It was an all-day thing dedicated to the Lord. Uh, There's an idiom uh, usually used in American English. Uh, You can't see the forest for the trees. You can't see the forest for the trees. And of course, it means generally you're so busy looking on the details, you can't see the big picture. You know, you're so busy looking at the trees and you can't see the whole forest. Well, I would say that could apply to many a religious person and even a Christian. They get so caught up in the details, they can't see the big picture. They get so caught up on how to keep your Sabbath They forget on the Lord you're trying to please and what good you could be doing. A greater good, helping another fellow man. That comes up a lot in the Bible, by the way. Can't see the forest for the trees. Verse 11, then our final verse for today. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law were furious and they began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. So here he is doing good, and people hated him for it. And again, the biggest thing was he's changing things. He's popular, right? Why did Saul hate King David? Because he was popular. He was gaining notoriety. Why do people get upset when there's change? Simply because there is change. And I'm for change. I am very much for change. And I also have my traditions, both. And we have to kind of fight to keep both in check, right? I would much rather use medical practice of today than 200 years ago. Not even 1,000 years ago. I would much rather go to a doctor now than 200 years ago. You know, uh, my life or death ratio increases greatly if I get more modern medical techniques. There's a fine place where I'm happy tradition hasn't, isn't rock solid. And the same goes with indoor plumbing and electricity and all sorts of other wonderful things. I've grown very fond of them. So change is good. And I have my traditions. We do a Christmas Eve service here on Christmas Eve. A wonderful tradition. I don't plan to stop it anytime soon. You know? And uh, other things. The the Christmas boxes are going to be coming a tradition. I hope we don't stop doing those anytime soon. I have my traditions. But let's suppose we didn't do a Christmas Eve service someday. My tradition ends. I'm saying now that while I might be upset, guess what? Christianity still goes on. Your Christianity still goes on. My Christianity still goes on, whether I have my favorite traditions or not. Why? Because they're traditions. And they kind of need to be kept in that category, not elevated to, this is the extra special law of God I'm doing, therefore I'm cool, or he must bless me extra, as we read in some of those other passages. And that final line in our verse And they began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. Now let's face it. He is popular. He's gaining ground. He's teaching things. And just as pastors, we've seen him teach things. We've seen him heal a guy. Hard to explain that one away. I'm not talking about kind of the TV kind of healings where you don't know that person. You know, you don't know if they were really crippled. On TV, they got up and got out of the wheelchair. Or, you know, they came up with a limp and walked away skipping. And I hope they did. I really do. But we don't know them. Well, in smaller villages and towns, people know you. If that guy had a withered hand, chances everybody around knew that was, you know, they probably called him lefty or something, right? And people aren't always that kind, especially school-aged children. 
And whatever he may have been called, they probably knew him. And when his hand was no longer withered, you can't say that was a trick. You can't say, well, that guy just came in from some chances. Are they knew him? They saw it. What to do with Jesus as he's doing these things? What are they going to do with him? And they want to kill him. Well, I suggest a similar question today as we close. Jesus has shut down the mouths of the supposedly religious and taught them true religion. Jesus has healed a man through the mighty power of God. What do you do with a guy like that? Well, you really, kind of the same two options, really. You can pick up rocks and throw them at him, either verbally or through the internet, that Jesus is just a bad guy, a phony, a make-believe. Or you can fall at his feet and worship him because he is a son of God and all the evidence to prove it. Which Jesus do you look for? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this time together and for your word. May we read it and reread it and look at it and see how we can become more like you want us to be. Help us guard our minds against becoming a Pharisee, a Sadducee, or something else. And just be a Christian all that we do, simplistically, wholly, trying to please you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you again for visiting us online. You are dismissed. Please, please, all of you, sit down. That's a joke. Yeah. <laughs>